I love the idea of celebrating the milestones. And it's good to see all those young men and women and those kids here. Isn't it good? Isn't it good? It's just so encouraging, so life-bringing, so good to have them here. Today I want to talk a little bit about those milestones that those kids are passing on their journey. And today I've got less of a sermon, more of a plea for this generation. It's less of kind of a put-together sermon and just more of me wanting to beg you that it's our responsibility to help our kids cross those milestones and reach the destination that God's called them to. See, because I know what happens. I know that, that you and I, as parents, we, we, we get all caught up in the 936. We get really busy with all of the stuff that comes along with each of those individual weeks in our kids' lives. I mean, think about all the things you got to do on any given week with your kids, for your kids. You know, you got to get them ready for school. You got to take them and drop them off there. You got to go to work. They got to do school. They just, there's homework. You got to get them to practice sometimes multiple times a week. You know, they got birthdays. Their friends have birthdays. Uh, you got trips you got to take. You got obligations you got to fulfill. There's all kinds of stuff you got to do. And, and what happens is our 936, they partly go by so fast because we get so busy in them that they start to slip away before we even realize it. Right? We get all caught up in the distractions inside the 936, and, and we love to stop for a minute. We stop for just a minute, take a breath, and celebrate a milestone, a graduation, you know, a promotion into the next grade level. We love to stop, and we love to celebrate those milestones on that journey. But because we get so caught up, because we get so busy, we forget that the journey has a destination, that our whole objective is to have them on a road to somewhere. So we, we think about how we're going to get through the next of the 936, whichever one we're on at the moment. We think about how we're going to make it to the very next one. And we're focused on, you know, week 232 and then 233 and then 341. I mean, we're, we're focused on the next one, but we forget where this is all heading. We forget that we as parents, we as grandparents, we as the family of God, we have a much bigger picture that we're trying to paint in these kids' lives. Let me ask it a different way. It's the first blank on your page. What is your vision for week 937? You got 936 with your kid at home. What's your vision for the very next week? Who is your child becoming what are they turning into because listen to me parents listen to me grandparents listen to me family of god this is your life's great work right your legacy will be defined by what happens on and after week 937 who are those kids becoming? Do you know what you want for those kids? Do you have a vision for who they're becoming? I mean, I know what I want for your kids. I want your kids to be happy. I want them to experience joy and peace and walk in power and confidence. Don't you want that for your kids? Am I the only one? Don't you want that for your kids? And you and I know that the only way for them to really know joy and peace, happiness, the way for them to live a life of purpose and not on accident is to know Jesus Christ, their Savior, to follow in his footsteps thereby becoming the person that he has uniquely designed them to become it only comes through knowing him 
That's what I hope for for your kid. And I hope that's what you hope for. So here's my question. How are we doing on that? I mean, how are we doing to reach 937 and that kid be on their way following Jesus on their own? How are we doing on that? I know it's hard when we get busy, when we get caught up in the moment to keep that focus. So let's just take a look for a second at the reality. Okay? Can we do that? Can we do that? All right. I'm going to need some help in here today a little bit. So here's what a recent study from LifeWay Research shows us. It shows us at, that in the last few years of all of the Christian kids that we have graduated from high school who are part of the body of Christ and profess Jesus to be their Lord and Savior of all of the kids, there we go, of all the kids, an astonishing 68% of them have walked, let me see the 68%, Jamie, have walked away from church after graduation. Those are real statistics from multiple studies over the last several years. 68%, the majority, the large majority of our kids are walking away from everything we think we're building in them. We spend 936 weeks trying to build Christ into their life only to fail 68% of the time. Many of them, as they walk away, they are de- constructing their faith right they're literally taking it apart and saying look this thing doesn't even make any sense and they're walking away you seen this it's a huge movement among the millennials it's happening now and thousands thousands of them are deconstructing their faith and they're taking to youtube to talk about it have you seen these videos they're all over the place I've watched a hundred of them this past week and been heartbroken. I wish I had time to walk through any one of them with you, so I thought I would just show you a couple of clips. Let's look at a couple of clips right now. Hi, my name is Ellie. My pronouns are she, her. I was a hardcore Christian for most of my life, and now I'm not. And I've started this channel to talk about that, about my upbringing, in evangelical Christian fundamentalism and about my faith deconstruction. Hi everyone, it's Deborah. This is my first video talking about my deconversion from Christianity. It's not a full in-depth video, but it gives you a little bit of an overview of how I got to where I am today. And I've had a lot of requests to talk about this subject. Just wanted to share that I am exiting Christianity. Now, some people are going to freak out over that. Like, oh, his hell, uh, his his soul is damned to hell. He's exiting Christianity. I looked around at all the churches, all the Christians, all the teachings, the pastor, all the stuff that was being said in today, like now, and a lot of it seemed. Like complete nonsense to me. Uh, uh, there was contradictions. There's hypocrisy. There's extreme judgment. Christians living essentially like atheists and calling themselves Christians. Like it just made no sense to me, and it really bothered me. Today, I'm finally going to tell you guys the questions that I had in regards to Christianity and why I ended up giving up Christianity. If a lot of you guys don't know, a lot of you guys do, but I'm sure a lot of you guys don't. I grew up extremely Christian. My family is extremely Christian. Typical Christian family. Everybody in my family is Christian. So, like I'm grateful for um, Christianity in a sense because it taught me, <laughs> it taught me what I didn't believe in, what I didn't like, um, and I felt like, I felt like um, 
with religion they kind of like pushed it on me they definitely did like they definitely pushed me on it and like they're like if you don't believe in this or if you do this this and that then you're not <laughs> you're not a child of god exactly and like to me that just did not make sense is this really does this really make sense for me does this really make sense in the grand scheme of the world does this really make sense with who i believe jesus's character to be it's something that like i really wish that everyone would feel more comfortable doing i am a skeptic where i am a agnostic where i am sometimes borderline atheist aka i don't really know what i am or where i'm at i just know that i'm questioning a lot in everything and so i just i can't in good conscience or just you know realistically i can't call myself a christian anymore i believe in god i believe in a lot of church history uh you know i believe a lot of things that christians believe but i can't i just can't deal with i can't deal with christianity anymore i just can't do it man i cannot do it never could i have imagined back then that someday i would ever reach a point where i would no longer consider myself to be a follower of jesus how we how we doing how does that strike you without joy, without hope. And these are our kids. These are our kids. I mean, not, you know, your children and my children personally, but they are the product of the body of Christ. Whatever we think we're doing, we're failing. It's, it's not working. We think we're, we're working hard for each of these 936, but something isn't connecting and it all seems to be falling apart. And <clears throat> I think I think I've started to kind of try to figure out a little bit of this. I'm going to try to tell you what I think about it. So bear with me for just a minute because I got to kind of make this case, okay? Let's just think this through for a second. You see, I believe that the single most unifying character trait of God is truth. Right? I mean, I believe that above all else, the thing that unifies us is God's truth. I don't mean that God tells the truth. He does. I, I don't mean that truth comes from God. It does. I mean that whatever God is, that's the truth. God is truth. Can I, can I get an amen on that? So he alone is truth, and this is why it's unifying, because as long as you and I are believing in his absolute truth, humbly following and obeying his absolute truth. This is an extremely unifying thing because what that does is it aligns us all together. We begin moving together in the same direction, coming together as we come closer to him. It's unifying. Does that make sense? Absolute truth from God is unifying. But our culture no longer has the stomach for absolute truth. Am I right? You know, it happened about 50 years ago. We really just, as a culture, began to just slide away from the concept of absolute truth and slide more and more and more into relativistic truth. You know, what's true for me may not be true for you. You know, your truth may have nothing to do with my truth. And I've got to be okay with that. In fact, Oprah tells us that the most empowering thing a human being can do is to know your truth and be able to express it. But here's the problem. As long as we all have our own version of truth, it's never going to unify us. What's it going to do? It's going to divide us. Because if you got your truth, you got your truth, you got your truth, and I got mine then we're all moving in different directions. We're all moving in our own way. That's divisive, not unifying. That's breaking, that's tearing, that's ripping apart, not bringing us together. So I believe that God's single most unifying characteristic is his truth. And I think that I've watched, I know I've watched this 
change from absolute truth over into relativism i've watched it grow and grow and grow all my life i've seen it as a youth pastor i watched it more it just compounded on our kids more and more all the time but over the last four or five six years i think we've had a major seismic shift in our culture's perspective on truth. I would say that we are no longer a relativistic truth society. I would say today we are an actually a post-truth society. I'd say that we have abandoned the concept of truth anymore. You do it yourself. I mean, think about it. You want to know what's going on in the world, and I want to know what's happening in Israel. Why, did, why, why are all those rockets going off? And why are those buildings coming, crumbling down? You will tune into the news to find out what's going on, whether it's on television or whether it's online, and you will self-select the news angle that you prefer. You watch one channel, it's all Israel's fault. You watch another channel, it's all uh, Palestinians' fault. What's the truth? We don't even know. If you ask 20 different people about what's really the truth about the pandemic, you'll get 20 different answers. And every single one of them is absolutely convinced that their version of the truth is the correct one. Can that be true? Can they all be true? No. So it divides and I would say that I don't even know what's true anymore about most of that stuff. You know, ask me about the truth about masks. And I can show you this study on one hand that says they're about 90% effective. And I can show you this study on the other hand that says they're about 0% effective. What's the truth? I don't know. You can ask me the truth about the gas shortage. What really happened there? You can ask me the truth about the 2020 election. And dude, will I get some opinions but I don't know if I'll ever find the truth. What even is the truth anymore? We live in a post-truth society. It's confusing. It leads people to go and hoard gasoline just because someone said there might be a little bit of a you know, single-digit percentage of a shortage. It's making us crazy. It's dividing us against each other. And you and I, Adults, adults in the room. Let me talk to adults in the room for just a second. Adults in the room, hello? You and I, we're trying to learn to navigate this. We're confused and we're torn and we don't know even what to think about half this stuff anymore and we're just trying to get our feet under us and navigate through it right now. But I've got worse news for you. Your kids will never know anything but this. They're not learning to navigate it. They're being raised in it. And so they will scroll through their stream and they will find every opinion that you can imagine about it. They will find all of the, all of the, of the information that they can possibly find, all the opinions about everything. And like you and like me, when they click enough times, the algorithms will all learn their behaviors and preferences and get them into their own echo chamber of what they want to believe. And not just about the pandemic, but about God. And about who they are. And about the beautiful creature they were designed to be. They'll find out their echo chamber version of the truth just like you and I do. Here's the problem with our world today. Maybe you can agree with me or not. I don't know. But I think the problem is, next blank on your page, that our world is full of unlimited information but very little wisdom. You can find all the answers to all the questions you want, man. I was, part, I was on the motorcycle this week, and I stopped between, literally between two restaurants on a road. And I was trying to figure out where I wanted to have dinner. And so I was like, oh, I'll just, uh, that one looks good. And I just looked on my map, and there it was on my map right next to me, and I tapped it and gave me the Yelp reviews, all one stars. Mm, let me check this one tapped on it in the map it gave me all the yelp reviews and all five stars guess where i ate dinner and it was terrible <laughs> it was terrible it really was not good i thought it was going to be good it wasn't good 
I'm telling you, you can find all kinds of information, but very, very little wisdom. You can find all the answers, but almost no truth anymore. And your kids are consuming all the time. And here's the thing. All that information that's buzzing around out there, all that conflicting, dividing, confusing, distorting information, your kids are consuming it all the time, all the time, just like you are. And they're wired to consume it on a much more hyper-connected level than you and I ever will. Am I right? They're consuming it all the time. And it's not just digital. I mean, they're, they're consuming the agenda in the school system, on the TV shows they watch, when they're on YouTube, on Netflix, when they're on Instagram, on Facebook. They're consuming information. And here's the thing about information for all of us is that information doesn't just inform us, it actually forms us. What you consume doesn't just inform you, it forms you. The more you consume of a particular thing, the more it forms you into its image. Am I right? I mean, that's why we in the church have always been about, dude, we need to be in the Word. We need to be immersed in God's Word. Memorize it, study it, meditate on it. That's why we're in it, because it's what you consume that forms you. Most of us are much more consuming Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff than we are the truth, the Word of God. And as what you consume forms you, it actually alters your direction, changes your destiny. So parents, you're working hard in these 936 to, to try to build, to try to paint a picture, to try to do something. But your kid's consuming and it's moving them in directions that you may not want them to go. Maybe moving you in directions that you don't want to go. And it's easy to see why we're losing this fight. It's easy to see because here, let me show you one more graph. Because the average Christian family invests approximately one hour a week into their child's spiritual formation. At 167 hours, 168 hours, one hour a week, average church family. They drop their kid off with somebody else and hope that that person, whoever that is, leverages their hour. Okay, it's probably like 40 minutes. Maybe it's like 30 minutes because they got to play games and they got to do other stuff too. Calm them down, get them quiet. Hoping, they, hoping somebody else leverages that time really well so that it builds something into their lives. Really? That's our strategy. The world has them the rest of the time and we invest an hour. Is that, is that going to be adequate? Is that going to work? Of course it's not going to work. But I know you, I know you, you are not the average family. You're above average. Can I get an amen? You're far above average. So let's just, okay, far above average, far above average. Let's, me and you, let's just take this statistic and let's double it. Now, let's quadruple it. And let's say instead of one hour, you got four hours a week. Woo, you're doing great. Oh, let me even help you a little bit more because realistically they sleep a lot. So let's take out the section where they sleep, okay? Unless they're a teenager, this may take up a lot more. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, that's just Saturday. For the, for, for <laughs> so, okay, but still, still, if you're way above average and if you don't count the time they sleep, still, is this an adequate strategy? Is that level of investment spiritually into our kids adequate to build Christ into the next generation? How are we doing on that? What's your diagnosis? Who's doing poorly? We are. We are. It's not the kid's fault. We're doing poorly. And I'm even talking to people who don't have kids at home right now. All of us are in this together. We are the family of God. We're here for each other. I know, like Jeff said earlier, you come in here a lot of times expecting to sing a few songs, watch a good show, and go home. That's bull, man. That's a lie from the devil. That's not who you're made to be. Stop buying the lie. 
you are the hands and feet of Jesus. You're part of the body of Christ. And I'm here for you. You're here for me. And we're all here for this next generation. We're building people to follow behind us. And we're failing. We're failing. My diagnosis is that we're failing. 68%. That's failure. So it really should not be a surprise to anyone, right? We should not be shocked by this because we know what we're doing and we've seen this happen before. You know the story. After Moses, after Joshua, the people of Israel who had seen God work miraculously time and time again, he rescued them from Egypt, led them across the water on dry land, ruined the Egyptian army behind him and provided for them during those 40 years while he allowed them to wander in the desert because of their disobedience. Finally, finally, a generation later, God comes good on his promise. And through Joshua, God led them into the promised land that land that he had been promising them and promising them for generation after generation all the way back to Abraham. He'd been saying, this will be your land. You will live there and you will be my people and I will be your God. The answers to all their prayers were finally coming true as God miraculously led them in and they possessed the land. They came in and they occupied city after city after city and God went before them. And they experienced victory after victory after victory. Moses, their leader, had just passed away a few years before. And as all this is finishing up, as their victory in the land is all coming to a close, then their leader, Joshua, passes away. And then the next phase of Israel's life begins. And it begins with this statement right here. We find it in the book of Judges. It says, In those days, Israel had no king. Israel had no one calling them back to the truth. No one saying, This is who God is, and this is who He's called us to be. Remember who we are. Come back to the truth. Align around God's truth. There was no king doing that for them. And so all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Just like today, everyone's got their own version of truth. And you probably know what happened. It's at this moment that the nation of Israel is plunged into the deepest, darkest, most horrific period of its biblical history where there are unspeakable horror stories of immorality and injustice, of murder, of rape, of incest, of all kinds of wickedness and evil and pain and suffering, all because they did what was right in their own eyes. They all had their own version of truth. It's happened before. Is it happening again? I think this is what's happening. I think we have gotten away from the truth of God. And I think it's happening again. And I know we live in L.A.J. We live in L.A.J. So we're all good. They're all bad. It's all happening somewhere far away from us. Again, lie from the pit of hell. It's happening now. Right here. Right among us. Talk about kids not knowing what the truth is. Being distorted and disconnected and misaligned I had, a, I had an administrator at the school system tell me that up to 33% of the girls at Gilmer High School today identify as lesbians 33% up to 33% maybe a third of the girls now I gotta ask you what just happened Because for all of human history, there's never been 33% of the population of anybody identify as gay, right? It's always been single digits. It's always been that way, always. Has humanity suddenly changed? 
at high school? Has there all of a sudden been a surge of sexual awakening of some kind? Has that happened? Or, in the absence of absolute truth to anchor to, are people desperately grasping at whatever they can to have a sense of identity and purpose in their life? This is what the lack of truth does to us. It confuses us about who we are. It it causes us to lose sight of the beautiful image that God has made us in to reflect himself. And it's made us make up stories about ourselves so that we can be seen to be something that we aren't. My friend Chelsea started school here a year ago. And on one of her first days at school, another girl came up to her and said, hey, so welcome to Gilmore High School. Are you a lesbian? And Chelsea says, well, no, 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 (laughs) no. And the girl said, well, why not? And that's kind of my question too. Why not? I mean, in absence of an anchoring truth about who you are, why not be whatever you feel like becoming? Why not make up whatever story you got to make up so that you can have some of the drama in your life, so that you can have some of the attention in your life? You would think that a highly individualistic, self-centered culture would make people mentally strong, but it turns out it's killing us. Kids today are far, far more anxious than ever you hear me kids today are anxious they're fragile today i mean you guys remember what it was like to grow up in school it's a whole different environment now than it was then despite being hyper connected students report feeling much more disconnected than ever Loneliness is one of the top emotional problems of high school students in our society today. Low self-esteem, fear, and depression plague this generation. Here's the fact of the matter. Next blank on your page. Our culture is crippling this generation. Our culture is crippling us. And I'm sorry to say it, but this is our legacy. This is what we are leaving behind this is who we're building we think we're doing it right but all the statistics say that we're not but i think we can do better i think we must do better i think for the sake of our children for the sake of our nation for the sake of our families i think we must do better So here's my question. What if, what if the body of Christ actually had a built-in solution to this problem? What if we had a way to anchor kids to something much more solid than the whims of the culture and the media today? What if there is a way we could tether them to something that would get their feet solidly beneath them so that they would live confidently knowing who they are and where they're going? Wouldn't we want to do everything we can to get that anchor underneath their feet? Wouldn't we? Wouldn't you want to do whatever you could do to help them to manage and to have hope in this chaotic storm of a disaster that our culture is becoming? God promises us, and it's reiterated in Hebrews. He says, this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. You see, God's plan for me and for you is not to push our religion on anybody. That's not the goal. Our goal is to soften hearts to Jesus 
And instead of, instead of us all going in our own direction, doing our own, let's just let him write his own laws on our hearts. Let's let him write his name on our children's hearts. Let's let him just pierce their hearts in ways that you and I never could. And let him be the focal point of their lives. Can I get an amen on that? So what if, what if our kids actually understood that they had a reason for existing? What if they actually understood that they had a purpose in life? And what if they actually knew how to walk that out? How would that impact the anxiety level of a generation? How would that change depression that has gotten all over a generation? How might that change the world that we live in. So how do we do this? How do we do this? What must we do now? It's really simple, and you know the answer. Because we say it all the time, we talk about it all the time in here, that God has called us to be something that we frankly have neglected being. You and I have neglected being. He calls us to be, here's the next blank on your page, a community of unity. He calls us to become a group of people who are aligned together with each other and aligned toward God as we together are drawing closer and moving to him. Unified. That's what communion is all about. It symbolizes communing with each other and communing with Christ. We do this all the time. And how does that look? What does it look like? We say it every Sunday over and over again in here. You guys are great at repeating it back to me. We do this by loving God, loving others and what and making disciples that's what we do we worship together we get up against each other in groups and we lift each other up and bear each other's burdens support each other encourage each other pray for each other we serve each other we pour ourselves out because we're trying to be like jesus right who came here and what did he do? Poured himself out. Oh, well, I'm too tired for a crucifixion today. Maybe tomorrow, Father. Good grief. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? He just goes, pours himself out. That's who we're called to be. We're called to unite around the absolute truth of God by loving God, loving others, and making disciples. And man, do we want to be loving God by loving his word. Right? That's why it tells us in Deuteronomy, God says, commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words, to this truth of mine. And here's what he says. Invest about an hour a week in it. Is that what he says? Invest four hours. Invest 12 hours. You don't have 12 hours. Invest six and a half, and I will try to work the rest for you. Is that what he says? Look at what he says. He says, tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them at home. Talk about them when you're on the road. Talk about them when you're going to bed. Talk about them when you're getting up. Write them on your doorposts and on your gates. Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. This isn't about investing an hour or two or three or four a week. This is about saturating your family in the word of God. Saturating everything you say, everything you do, everywhere you go, just having it saturated in the truth of God. So you don't have, you know, spiritual time and non-spiritual time. Everything, everything belongs to him, is for him, and points us to him, aligns us with him. We've got to stop dropping our kids off at church and hoping somebody else will take advantage of that hour. And you need to be all about it, mom and dad. You need to be all about it, grandma and grandpa. You need to be all about it, neighbor, because we're the family, 
and we support each other. And if the next generation has any hope, it's up to us. God put you here for them. So, hey, I know I don't need to go into a lot of detail on this. You know how this works. You know what it means to love God, love others, make disciples. We've got a pattern for that. It's just a template. It's a starting off point, and you know all about it. So I don't have to go into too much detail. Here's the thing about it. And you all know this. The problem is going to be solved with a pretty simple solution. The solution is simple. You hear me? It's simple. Love God, love others, make disciples. Simple. The problem is the execution is hard. Because it's going to cost every one of us something. If we care at all about the next generation, it will cost us something. I mean, it may mean... You have to sleep in a little less on Sunday. May mean you're watching on our internet broadcast right now when you should be here with your family. It may mean you have to give up a night of the week and actually be in a life group. I know you don't have time. I know you're busy. I understand that. But really isn't isn't that next generation important enough to you? Because even if you don't have kids at home, and even if you're in a life group without kids, you're supporting other families that are supporting other families. That's the way this works. I didn't design it. I didn't make it up. He did. (laughs) And it's what he calls us to do. It may mean you have to quit being so anonymous here on Sunday mornings, you know, sliding in late, getting out a little early. Nobody really knows you. You just smile and do the church wave. You know, it's like the, you got the Jeep wave. You got the bike wave. Then you got the Christian wave. I don't know what that is. Not in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Christian wave looks a lot more like this. Am I right? COVID or not, amen. It looks like this. It means that we are one together and we're doing this together and we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for those graduating seniors. We're doing it for those kids like Anna promoting up to the next level. We're doing it so that they can become everything God wants them to become. He put us here for that. And we have failed long enough. Those kids have so much potential, and they are our future. And we've gotten caught up in the 936, but it's time for us to turn our eyes towards 937 and start focusing forward, remembering what we're here for. We all know what it's like to be busy. Jesus encountered a busy story himself. Right, as he's traveling to Jerusalem, Luke tells us how it happened, and you're probably really familiar with this story. Jesus is continuing on his trip to Jerusalem, and they came along to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to Jesus, focusing on him just receiving every word that comes from his mouth, soaking it all in. Yeah, she's doing great. Martha, on the other hand, was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She's running around, clanking things in the kitchen, making noise, and she's getting the plates ready and, you know, smoothing the cloth out, and she's getting everything ready while her sister just sits there at Jesus' feet. So Martha gets irritated after a few minutes. She comes to Jesus, and she says, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to get off her butt and come help me. You've said it before about your sister. (laughs) I heard heard an apology on the front row. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. (laughs) But the Lord Jesus said to her, my dear Martha, that's actually not what he said. The actual, in, in the actual New Testament, original language, he says this, 
Martha, Martha. He says it twice. Like he says it to me a lot of times. He looks at my busyness, my distractedness, my not paying attention to him like I should. <sighs> Steve, Steve. Sometimes he says it to me through those lips right there. <laughs> Steve, Steve. Does he say it to you? Do you sometimes get so busy and distracted that you miss the important thing? You miss the big thing? And he says, Martha... Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. Getting the kid to practice on time. Making sure the laundry's done. Making sure the homework is all complete. Phoning all the friends for the party next week. Oh, you're so busy with all the distractions. But, he says, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Have you discovered the one thing? Have you discovered the one thing that's most important? I promise you it's not soccer practice. And I promise you it's not homework. It's not even schoolwork. And guess what? The one thing, it's not even your kid. The one thing is Jesus. He's the one worth being concerned about. And I'm talking to everyone in the room, current parent with kids at home or kids gone or no kids yet or whatever your status is, I'm talking to you. Jesus is the one thing. And until you model it, the kids are never going to get it. Until you and I live it out, the kids will never see it in the first place. So rediscover the one thing. Parents, I want to invite you to a real special opportunity on this. You don't know where to start, don't know how to get your foot in and get going on this. Well, I'm really proud of Bert and Aubrey because they are starting a limited time parent life group. And they're going to do it in their house, right? You're going to do it in your house? You're going to do it here at the church, right there in the back of the room? Where? Yes, okay. You're going to do it here at the church on Wednesday nights. You might have noticed the mini Bert when you came in. Did you like the mini Bert, Bert? <laughs> Did you like that? <laughs> it doesn't look anything like, okay. Are you going to take it home? I tell you what, you should sign it. You should autograph it, and we'll auction it off or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would scare me, too. I bet it scares Aubrey every day. <laughs> But they're starting a parenting life group around a book called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. You don't have the capacity to invest more. You're already going at full throttle. How can you invest more? Listen, they're going to do a study together to find out how we can saturate instead of trying to pick an hour here and there. That's a bad strategy. Saturate. Immerse your kid in it. That's what their study is all about. And it starts this Wednesday. So it's starting just now as school is letting out. I know it's going into summertime, but they've got a plan for some flexibility for you in that. It's going to be from now all the way, well, it's going to be six weeks long-ish. Okay, so that'll be good. If you want to know more about it, when the service is over, just go right back there to the mini Bert and talk to them, and uh, you guys can get going on that this week. Another way you can get involved, whether you're a current parent of kids at home or not, is there's still places left to serve at Vacation Bible School and at Seamless Summer. Boy, the way that we can model this the best for our kids is for us to just believe it and to do it. There's not many spaces left on Seamless Summer, so you better get them while they're, while they're still there. But I would really encourage you, don't leave today without meaning it, without taking a step for our next generation, whether it's serving or whether it's being in that parent life group. Because my goal for you, my hope for you, is that you will, last blank, rediscover the one thing. Rediscover what it's really about. It's about Jesus. And once you parents, once you neighbors, once you family members buy into him and are sold out to him, the 936 will fall into place. And 937 will be exactly what Jesus wants it to be.